Welcome to the Artist Advisory Hotline, the podcast for artists who want valuable guidance and honest answers on how to grow their careers and develop their new project from leading art world experts and artists. Here's your host and founder of the Artist Advisory, Marina Press Granger. Tune in as she gets you the answers you deserve. Hello, artists. I'm your host, Marina Granger. And today on the hotline, we've got some more questions from our listeners. I can't wait to dive into them. But before we do, I have to talk to you about the upcoming solar eclipse. Have you ever witnessed a solar eclipse in totality, meaning the moon completely covering the sun where you are and it actually becoming dark for you know, four minutes or three minutes or however long the eclipse is. I have never experienced that. And I'm going to this Monday, I'm going to go up to Buffalo, New York to see the eclipse. I'm going with one of my best friends who's from Buffalo. And hopefully we'll be able to take her dad's boat out on the lake and it'll be so fun. Uh, but, and so I'm curious to know what you guys will be doing for the eclipse. Now, if you're into manifesting and manifesting is really all about setting an intention and taking inspired action and stepping into the new you that it will create. If you're into that, you might be thinking, well, it's a new moon. It's a solar eclipse. Generally solar eclipses are when we want to set our intentions on something new that we're starting. And new moons are similar in that way. But there's an astrologer, Eliza Kelly, who recently spoke about this. And she said, it's actually not a great idea to manifest during the solar eclipse. And also solar and lunar eclipses, all these things, they're so volatile. But she says it's not a great idea because... Solar eclipses run on an 18-year cycle. So when you manifest on an on a solar eclipse, it can take your manifestations 18 years to come to fruition. And how do you even know what you'll want in 18 years? Did you want what you wanted today 18 years ago? <laughs> so I really think that that's pretty interesting that she said that. And I wanted to amplify her message here on the podcast. Another thing to consider is that whenever you are setting intentions, whenever you are manifesting, one thing, one phrase to say to the universe when you're doing this is this or something better. So instead of saying, oh, in 18 years, I will have my retrospective at the MoMA, say in 18 years, I will have my retrospective at the MoMA or something better, right? Because you want to let the universe create whatever it wants to create with you. Don't limit yourself, right? So the other thing that I wanted to touch upon before we dive into our questions is that lately I've been getting so many questions about alignment. So many artists are asking me how to reconcile having two or more very different bodies of work, how to proceed if they're going into creating something totally different. How do you even like do that? <laughs> right. And one thing that I want to say is that you can have different iterations of your work, right? You can have like a totally different series, a totally different type of work. And the one common thread that connects it is your intention. It's why you do what you do. And so in that way, you can connect all of those different bodies of work and they still feel cohesive. And it's similar to what you know, and that's why I always have that elevator pitch formula going for all of you guys. Like, I'm like, why you do what you do, how your perspective informs your work, and then what you do. You don't ever want to lead with what you do, because when you lead with what you do, whoever is listening is just going to imagine the last, you know, abstract 
pink painting that they heard about <laughs> or, or whatever it is. So that's not going to make them remember exactly what your work is. What's going to make them remember is why you do what you do. How your perspective informs your work is going to make them feel like you are the only one who is even qualified to make that type of work. And then what you do, it's just, it doesn't matter because they're already sold on the first two and you can change what you do over and over again. And a good a way to think about this is actually what I heard on a podcast called The Spiritual Hustler. And it's a podcast with Jessica Zweig, who's a great branding genius. And she says, you know, in every business, it's totally okay to rebrand yourself. Think of it as putting out new albums, right? Like Beyonce has a new persona a new theme with every album. And in that way, it's analogous to having different series for your artwork. And as she goes on and creates these new, as as she goes on to create these new artworks, what she's doing is she is keeping her intention constant. Like the intention why she does what she does is always the same how her perspective informs the work is going to change a little bit with each album. And so it might change a little bit with each series for you because maybe your perspective shows up in the medium or in the subject matter of the work or in the size of the work or whatever, right? It will shift a little bit. And then what you, why you do what you do is always going to shift. So when it comes to being in alignment, trust that you truly are in alignment, right? Uh, Another thing that came up recently, and I was just talking to an artist about this and a friend who had an opportunity to just did not feel like it was in alignment. And, you know, sometimes opportunities, whether they're exhibitions, whether they're commissions or uh, press opportunities or whoever, right? Whatever they are, when it comes to these things, it's sometimes when they, you don't feel in alignment with them, it's because the balance between giving and taking, whether you're the giver or the taker in the situation, and it's okay to be either, right? Sometimes it's actually really great for us to be the taker because we learn how to receive And sometimes it's wonderful for us to be the giver because it feels good to bestow our purpose on someone, right? Or whatever it is. But when that balance is off, then what's happening, right, is feeling like it's out of alignment. So when you feel like you are giving too much and when you think about these opportunities or whatever is feeling out of alignment, you feel like you're giving too much, then it's up to you. It's your job to set a boundary and say, hey, I can only do this. I can't do everything. I can't give you constant revisions of a composition of this portrait that you've commissioned me to do. That's just impossible. (laughs) And so you can set a boundary. You can say, let's set up a payment plan. So I'll take one third, so 33.3% to start. And then after you approve one of the three compositions that I give you, I'll take another third. And then upon delivery, I'll take the final third, right? And so that actually puts more than 50% in your pocket before you even start making the actual artwork. You're just giving them sketches before then, right? So you don't invest too much of yourself and your time and materials into it. When you feel like you're being too much of a taker, really evaluate your self-worth in the situation. Sometimes you might feel like, let's say you're invited to show in a group exhibition 
with some of the best artists working today and you're feeling like it's just impossible. You're like, there's no way I can't, I can't, I don't have anything ready. I am nothing ready. That's actually good enough to show. That's when you feel like you are the taker in the situation and you pull out of it because you feel like you might be taking too much. You may be taking on too much of that notoriety. So that's when you start to evaluate your self-worth. And guess what? If you're invited to do something like that, you deserve to do it, right? So don't hold yourself back. And so (laughs) that's kind of um, a good way to think about giving and taking an alignment. And I feel like I've learned all of these things from listening to uh, David Guyam and from reading uh, Jamie Jamie Kern Lima's book, were uh what is it called worthy (laughs) I think it's really good she starts off the book by saying how she had uh she had like a four-hour lunch with Oprah and Oprah gave her her personal phone number and she never had the balls to call Oprah she was like (laughs) or should I say ovaries she never had the ovaries (laughs) she she didn't have the um She just wouldn't allow herself to call Oprah because she realized for four years she didn't call her because she felt like she wasn't worthy of Oprah's time, right? So anyway, so that's that. So let's dive into our first question, which is kind of about alignment. And uh, it's from the artist, so an artist named Tia, right? So I don't know if I can use your full name, so I'll just call you Tia. Tia, thank you so much for sending in this question. So I'll read this for you guys. Tia says, I'm moving in a very different direction and finding my true purpose through combining art and spirit in a way that feels very good to me and cohesive. My question is, is it too early? Is it premature to do PR, press releases, pitches, etc.? when I only have a few things on my new site that reflect this new body of work. I'm working on archival prints, which is costlier and more complex than I had realized, and it's taking much longer and more hours than expected. I need a vacate. Yay, <laughs> you'll get one. Um, but the um, the key there, and I, this is not part of the question, but what you want to say is not I need a vacay, but I want a vacay. When you put the the energy of want out there, you're more likely to get it than if you put the energy of need out there. Okay, so going on with Tia's question, and I'm running on fumes, but want to get going with things as well. So the real question here is, Look, is it too early to do PR if I only have a few of this a few bits of this new work on my website, right? So here's an analogy that I really love that I heard on Jessica Zweig's or sorry, Jessica Zweig's <laughs> podcast. She pronounces it the English way. Um so she has a podcast called The Spiritual Hustler, and she talks about how in business you have, you can rebrand, you can do it like Beyonce and Taylor Swift and Madonna do it with their albums. With every album, they take on a new persona. So think of yourself this way. This is a new album that you're taking on in your career. You're creating a new direction, right, for your work. So fully embody that as you are already doing, I'm sure, on your website, on your social media. And you can, once you fully embody that, and I would say have like three works that you can show people. And there's so many, so much content that you can create with just three artworks. And whether it's on your website or on your social media, you can create B-roll footage, meaning uh, just footage of you mixing the type of colors or applying that type of color to uh, paper or canvas or whatever you work on, right? And splice it in and create a reel that way. And so 
when you create this whole new, when you launch this new persona as fully as you can, right? You don't need that much artwork, just like two or three. I would say three is better because if it's two, you know, they kind of speak to each other. If it's three, they tell a whole story, right? That's when you start diving in and connecting. So right now you want to connect to the press organically. You want to start following accounts on Instagram that maybe are blogs or uh, podcasts that deal with spirituality and art and things like that. And whatever the themes are in your work and start to anyone who can amplify the work, anyone who has an audience that's interested in art and spirituality, they can amplify your work. That's who you need to build organic connections with. And then once you are done building those organic connections, you can start to pitch them and you can start to reach out to them and say like, hey, um, I've got this new body of work. I'd love to talk to you about it. Here's why I do it, blah, blah, blah. And if you need to send a press kit to them, you can just have it ready. But here's the thing when it comes to PR. PR is really for something that is timely. And usually it's some sort of event. Like in the art world, it's usually an exhibition. But you can also have PR that's not necessarily in the art world, but art world adjacent. Or in the art world, but more like interviews. And those could be classif uh, they could be categorized as like lifestyle publications right so maybe you it would be interesting for you to go on podcasts that deal with spirituality or uh make connections with online blogs that have to deal with spirituality and you can talk to them and bestow your wisdom on them and also and just start there and go bigger right and so when you're doing these press kits, unless you have something super timely, and I know you're thinking like, well, I'm going to finish this whole series. That's a huge event. Yeah, it's a huge event, but it's more like, well, you would need to show it somewhere for people to know, right? Maybe it's in your studio or something like that. So it's either that kind of like review thing where it's super timely, or it's a lifestyle press thing. So when you're creating a lifestyle press kit, you really don't need that much artwork. You just need your story and some great photos of you in your exciting space in your studio, right? Uh, because that will get the lifestyle vibe going. When it comes to your prints, I did take a look on your website and I'll say to you today, like I said it to, was it Emily last week I spoke about, uh, who also had prints, you really want to limit the amount of prints you have at the different sizes and at least sell out one edition, right? So maybe uh, you have eight by 10, you have five available, uh, 16 by 20, you have three available. And five by seven, you have 10 available or something like that. So you, it's more likely that you can sell that out. And if you even want to create more of those prints, you can create them at different sizes, right? As long as the ratio is the same, whatever, right? You could create another edition of five or three at uh, 20 by 30 or whatever it is. So really limit that edition size because you want to create a space where the work is not oversaturated in availability, right? Where you can't just get it all the time. And that creates a need for people to buy it faster. They're going to think, wait, it's going to run out of the edition's going to end and I'm not going to be able to get it. But when it's an open edition, people are sitting there thinking, oh, I'll buy it next week. And then they forget. <laughs> so that is another reason to have 
smaller addition numbers or to have addition numbers, period. And finally, when you have those addition numbers, you don't have to go wild <laughs> trying to print like 10 of each size right away or whatever. You can have one of each size available on hand to go, or you could print three at a time. It might be pretty reasonable, right, to do that. So it depends what printer you're working with and their pricing, but that's my advice to you. So let's move on to our next question. And our next question is from Jen. So Jen also has a publicity question. You guys, my middle name is Press. So <laughs> there we go. Actually, it was my maiden name, but I have changed it to my middle name because I didn't want to have a hyphenated name when I got married. Anyway, so enough about me. Let's talk about Jen. <laughs> okay, Jen says, I have some questions about art magazines. Do you have any favorites that are abstract focused? Are there magazines that collectors gravitate to? Are there magazines that you would recommend an abstract emerging artist like myself submit to their open call process? Like if they have one, if magazines don't have an open call process, is there a way to get your work in front of them? So yes. Oh my gosh, Jen, so many ways to answer this question. So number one, I'll answer it backwards because this is like easier that way. So there are going to be two types of magazines or publications, ones that accept open calls and ones that do not accept open calls, very much like galleries, galleries that accept submissions and those that don't. And the ones that the magazines that do not accept open calls, you would send them what you call a press kit. So you would send them a press kit, which contains a press release, uh, five or so, three to five images of your work, a picture of you in the studio, a uh, list of images. So they have all the captions if they're that are ready to print. So the description of the artwork, who took the photo and all of these things. And then also uh, your CV, a bio written in the third person, any links to previous press that you have. That is what goes into a press kit, more or less. And you would put all of this on a Dropbox or Google Drive and send a link to the press kit uh, with a very catchy subject line and an email to the editor of the publication. And if the publication does more than just art, then you want to send it to the editor that's in charge of the part of the magazine where you feel like you could be published, right? It's more likely that they'll take a look rather than if you send it directly to the main editor, who's probably got a million and one things in their inbox, right? So that is <laughs> the answer to the that part of your question. And when it comes to magazines that accept open calls, right, that have open calls, uh, I've actually curated three. And it was really fun to do it because I got to learn and meet. So I mean, I got to look at so much new art. It was so fun. And I really learned so much about that open call process from the standpoint of a juror. So they are, so there's Create Magazine, which is quite competitive and really amazing, just a beautiful publication. And then there's a Visionary Arts Magazine uh, run by the, by Victoria Fry. She's the editor and that's a great magazine. They're also starting to include gallery reviews, which is really wonderful because when there's a gallery review, that's when the magazine, the gallery wants the magazine in their gallery. And when the magazine is in their gallery, then the collectors see it. Or the gallery sends an email blast about their, you know, their exhibition being reviewed in that magazine. And it goes to all the collectors. And guess what? Maybe they get interested in the magazine. And then they're interested in learning more about those artists. So 
that is a really good way to suss out if collectors are really gravitating to that magazine. When it comes to Create Magazine, they sometimes have exhibition reviews too, but most importantly, Create Magazine is carried in bookstores. And so it's not only artists that are actually subscribing to this magazine or seeing this magazine. It's people who walk into a bookstore and want to look at an art magazine. And those are your collectors, right? So that is really wonderful as well. Another magazine is Arts to Hearts Project, which is a wonderful, uh, I mean, overall organization uh, run by Charuka Aurora, who was on a previous podcast episode. And I was lucky enough to curate their second issue. And they just have, I think they're on their sixth issue now or something like that. They're just prolific and amazing. So you can check that out. So those are three that I'll tell you about right now. I think there's also Art Scene. And you can also get some good uh, interviews on Voyage LA. And um, what was the other one? Canvas Rebel. I still have to like fill out my interview questions for them, but they're amazing too. Now, when it really comes to targeting your marketing, if you're an abstract artist, and I, Jen, I looked at your website and I got an idea of the type of work that you make, I have a suggestion for you. And that is to look at uh, design based magazines like interior design, home design, you know, architectural digest would be a total like uh, game changer for this, right? Like it would be so cool to be in that. And that's super possible. I've worked with artists who have gotten into architectural digest, mostly because these really cool collectors collect their work and the collectors homes were photographed. But um, that is one way to do it, right? And actually, you guys, (laughs) the more I talk about this, the more I want to say all of this, all of this information, like how to do it and how to put together your press kit, how to find these mega collectors, how to approach them, that is in my course, the Artist Academy, which is available. It's a self-paced course that you can get. And if you go and look at the um, options to enroll in the course after watching my free masterclass on how you can present your artwork so you can get it in front of the right people. After you watch that masterclass, there's an offer for you to work with me one-to-one as well, in addition to the course. And it's like a total no-brainer. So if you're at all interested in this, I really recommend going and watching the masterclass. You'll learn so much about how to present your artwork, how to get in front of the right people. And on top of that, you get a very special offer to join the Artist Academy. So if you're interested, go ahead and do it. Just go and do it because I don't know how much longer I'll have that offer available. So back to you, Jen. So when it comes to these home design magazines, you can go for the magazines. And when you're uh, sending your press kit to a magazine that is a print magazine, you would want to send it about four months, three months at most, before their print publication comes out. That's how much lead time they need. So five months would be even better, right? So when you don't have anything that's super timely, that's cool. You could just send them a press kit. And when you create that press kit, you want to think of a really catchy and um, You want to think of a catchy subject line to put in the email, but you also want to think of something that is like a really good news angle, right? Like if there was a headline about you on on the front page of your uh, local newspaper, what would it be, (laughs) right? So that is the, the headline for the press release, so to speak. It's the news angle. It is the first thing that we get the idea about. So basically, it could be like uh, abstract paintings evoking feelings like never before or something like that. I mean, that's pretty vague in general, but 
you can uh, hone in, go into your elevator pitch, see if there's something catchy about your perspective. I feel like when I looked at your website, you lived in this beautiful, expansive, natural, like scenery kind of place. And maybe that has something to do with your work and how you channel nature and how your paintings are grounding. And why is grounding so important right now? Maybe it's because we have um, so much going on with the world being in flux or something like that. So maybe there's a really cool subject line there and a really good news angle there. But yes, in addition to the print magazines, I would suggest that you go and look for design blogs, like home design blogs, and submit your work to them. And if you want, you can also sort of get to know them on social media, get to know them on Instagram, follow them, engage with them, and then send a submission or your press kit over to them. You might even want to DM them and say like, hey, I've been following you for a while and I'd love to send you a press kit. Where, what's a good email, right? And so then it doesn't feel like it's a cold email that they're receiving. They feel like they know you. They'll look at it. They'll respond to you, hopefully very positively. Now, when it comes to these design-based magazines, which a lot of people who are designing their homes, who are thinking about what they want their home to look like, those are collectors for you. And that's why I want to recommend them to you. But when it comes to these magazines, sometimes they have this back of the magazine ad thing that you could do. Like they'll list like the 30, 30 artists or 100 artists and everybody gets like a little snippet and a tiny picture. <laughs> and a good example of something like this is in like House and Garden or um, magazine or something like that. I think the back of Vanity Fair has it too, but I'm not sure. And you can actually see on the page on the margin, it says that these are paid um, placements and like you can inquire for your information to be placed there. I've worked with artists who have done that, who have not <laughs> really gotten a lot out of it. It's really tough because very few people will like go and look through it. And even if they do, there's like over a hundred other artists that they're looking at in like such small, I mean, it's so tiny. So I wouldn't really recommend that you go for that. A lot of the time they really try to sell you on it when you send them a press kit, but I would say stand your ground and don't do that. <laughs> Another thing is uh, you can look at and this kind of goes to everyone, and I guess I've been doing a good amount of traveling, but the airlines usually have magazines <laughs> that they put in the um in the seat uh so that you know their upper class passengers can like read them or whatever or all the passengers can read them and I think that those magazines are probably really great and uh to get placement in because there are millions of people reading them uh, because they're just sitting on a plane and they often have uh, something going on. You know, there's often something uh, profiles and artists and things like that. So I would say, take a look at that. All right. So hopefully that answers your question and then some. So thank you, Jen. All right. Let's go to our final question here. And our final question is from Sandra. Sandra asks for a guide to pricing work considering variables such as gallery percentages. Does the artist share the discount offered to the collector? So generally speaking, when you start to work with a gallery, on average, it's going to be a 50-50 split. So uh, they're going to also take a maximum. They're going to have a consignment agreement with you. And on that consignment agreement, they will decide with you whether or not what's the biggest percentage discount they can give, right? So it'll be either 10, 15, or 20%. And on that consignment agreement, they will say that the discount is split the way that it's usually a standard one is set up. So yes, if you, if your gallery gives you a, 
gives your collector a 15% discount, then you're taking home a 43% or something like that, 42.3% of the sales price, because that's also what the gallery is taking, right? Now, after it, let's say you have a work of art that's been sitting in the gallery for a really long time, there might be an adjustment to this consignment agreement. You could call up the gallery and renegotiate that and see if they have someone who will buy it at a deeper discount. Also, a gallery might say, okay, well, we're not going to be able to sell this work unless I give a 30% discount. And I'm going to ask the artist if it's okay to do that. And generally, I would say that's fine because none of these prices are public. And in that way, the gallery might say, okay, I'll give them a 30% discount, but I'm only going to take 10% of that out of your end. So you get 40% and the discount is 30%. So the gallery gets the other 30%, right? So instead of taking the 50, they're eating most of that extra discount, right? So that can happen sometimes too. Hopefully that is clear. <laughs> I'm like, all of these numbers are I'm like, yeah, I don't know if <laughs> they're coming off well, but anyway. So the other thing is when a gallery works with a really established artist, uh, then sometimes they take a smaller percentage. It could be a 20-80 split. It could be a 30-70 uh, split or a 40-60 split, depending on how well-known that and coveted that artist is. And that usually goes for very established artists, you know, names like Damien Hirst and Jeff Koons and whoever, because chances are they already have their collectors. They don't really need the gallery. But also... <laughs> the price point is so high that the gallery is just happy to have the names of those collectors, right? And it just wants to show the artwork there for prestige. So that's why the split is sometimes different, right? Now, one thing that you might all be thinking is, well, how do I raise my prices when if I don't, if I'm not showing with a gallery and I'm showing with a gallery, then suddenly... I, if I don't raise my prices, I'm suddenly taking half home of what is usually given to me by my collectors. And you might think it's not worth it working with a gallery. Here's the thing. A gallery will take to a good gallery. will take a few works from you on consignment and see if they can sell it at a higher price. They're going to conservatively raise the price. So they're going to raise it by maybe 25% or 20% from what it is now in your studio. So if they sell it at 25% more, then you're taking home uh, about two thirds of the price instead of half, right? Or what they're going to do, and if they can sell it at 25% more, they're going to try selling it at 50% more. And if they can sell it at 50% more, then you're still, your price, your studio price, what you're getting still remains constant. And you're essentially doubling your prices because when you start to work with a gallery, you're introduced to a new pool of collectors that can afford that work, right? So you just need to make sure that the gallery can sell the work right? At that price before they double it, because then it's kind of weird if you lower the work for your collectors. Although I don't know a collector that would say, no, I'm not buying this because the price is lower. But uh, hopefully that gives you some clarity. And another question when it comes to galleries and finances is who is paying for the shipping and the framing? Chances are, so the etiquette is that the artist studio pays for shipping from the artist to the gallery and the return shipping either back to the studio or to the collector is covered by the gallery or if it's to a collector, sometimes they have the collector pay for the shipping. So 
when it comes for shipping, you're really only responsible for shipping it to the gallery. If it's too much of a stretch for you and the gallery has worked with you before, really believes in you, you can ask them to take the cost of the shipping out of your first sale. And what they're going to do is just arrange for the shipping for you and then add it to your tab, so to speak. Same with framing. Really, you would be responsible for the framing unless... Um, and if you can't pay for it, then the gallery might be able to front you. There are some, uh, times a gallery will pay for the framing and eat the cost if it works out for them financially. Like if the artwork is really, uh, pricey, like let's say it's a $125,000 artwork and the frame is only $4,000, they'll eat the price of the frame chances are they'll be like, whatever, right? But every gallery is different when it comes to this. I'll just tell you that uh, the one thing that's pretty constant is the shipping etiquette. And also the, um, you could probably negotiate with the gallery to give you like an advance for shipping or framing if they want you to pay for it. So hopefully that answers your question, Sandra. And I am just so, so grateful for all of these questions from you guys. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. Support your community by sharing this podcast, leaving a review and follow the artist advisory on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore advisory and visit us online at www.theartistadvisory.com.